Thank you. It's, it's a privilege to be here and to share with you, if a somewhat daunting one, I may say. But, uh, what I want to do is divide it into two parts. I want to look at first at, at who do you think you are, and then I want us to do some thinking about what we would like to cherish from our past and what we'd like to chuck on the bonfire. And then I want to move into part two about how we handle the inheritance that we've got as part of the United Reformed Church. Our spiritual DNA is complicated. 2,000 years old and more, if you count Jewish roots. Over the past 500 years, Protestant, Reformed, dissenting, Restorationist, Evangelical, Liberal. Over the past 100 years, Ecumenical, British, English, Welsh, Scottish, European, and over the past 50 years, increasingly globalized and multicultural, as the legacies of trade and colonialism, including slavery, resulted in massive movements of population from former empires of so-called Europe, so European mother countries. So to expect to encounter anything other than diversity from such complexity would be folly. And yet there are distinctive traits. We're not Anglicans, we're not Roman Catholics, we're not Quakers. So something of our prehistory, our history to the Restoration Settlement of 1662, our roots are to be found in the Church of England in the turbulent years of the 16th and 17th centuries as the Church struggled to discover its true shape in the wake of the Reformations which rewrote the religious map of Europe. Once we thought of the Church of England as a via media, a safe and sage path between the extremes of Geneva and Rome. We now know that this was not so. The Elizabethan and Jacobean Church of England was theologically a reformed Calvinist church aligned with other continental reformed churches. So the struggles and debates which engaged Puritans between the vestments controversy of 1566 and the restoration settlement of 1662 were all within the National Church, which was in a state of flux with no firmly fixed shape. Think of it, if you like, as a broad spectrum of ecclesiological opinion. The Tudor governments were united in their understanding of the Church. Tudor governments saw no reason to question the ancient geographical system of the parish, which prevailed across Europe from the west coast of Ireland to the east of what is now Poland. Every citizen belonged to a parish and was by right of birth a member of the church. And there was only one church, the national church. At the opposite end of the spectrum were a smattering of thinkers called separatists, whose ideological inclinations were similar to such continental radical groups as the Anabaptists and the Mennonites. They emerged first in England in the 1570s and 80s, and they believed that there was more to being a Christian than the good fortune of being born in a parish. It demanded a confession of faith, a knowledge of salvation, and for good Calvinists, which they all were, a conviction that you were one of God's elect. In other words, the godly should separate themselves from the ungodly. And that was a radical and dangerous stance. And John Greenwood, Henry Barrow, and a Welshman called John Penry paid the ultimate price in martyrdom for challenging the Elizabethan establishment in the 1580s and 90s. In an age when theological ideas had the same potency in political discourse that economics does in ours, such thinking was subversive. 
an attack on the unity of the state whose soul was the church. And recusant Catholics and separatists were alike potential traitors. A middle way was needed between the extremes that everyone was a Christian and a member of the church by their right of birth, and the separatist view that the godly should come out from amongst the ungodly. As Puritan theologians wrestled with the nature of the church in the early 17th century, other possibilities began to emerge. One catalyst in this story is the congregation of Puritan exiles in the Dutch city of Leiden under the ministry of John Robinson, better known as the chaplain to the Pilgrim Fathers, although he didn't sail with them. Robinson was a separatist, yet he praised the holy Presbyterian government of reformed churches on the continent and thought that while the Church of England was a false church, there were thousands of Christians within it. He also exercised a deep influence on his friend and fellow Puritan Henry Jacob, who was a singularly original ecclesiologist. He argued from scripture that the choice to form a congregation, to join one congregation rather than another, to elect officers and discipline members, all lay in the free consent of the people. And he founded a church in Southwark in 1616, yet refused to repudiate the congregations of the Church of England amongst which he ministered. What emerged was something new, a congregational middle way between separatism and the Church of England. If the Elizabethan separatists, the Pilgrim Fathers and Henry Jacob are to the left of the spectrum, Presbyterians were to the right. They too considered the Elizabethan and Jacobean churches to be but halfly reformed. Indeed, they thought the national church a ghastly hybrid with far too much medieval Catholicism in its DNA. But they never believed themselves to be dissenters. Rather, they sought a national, purified church, a purified national church, one in which power lay with councils rather than bishops, where proper respect was paid to the word of God through learned and regular preaching, and life was ordered scripturally. The debate about the true nature of the church continued into the turbulent years of the 17th century, in an England that the historian Claire Jackson has recently termed Devil Land. That was what a Dutch pamphleteer of 1652 thought England should be called. An unstable, failed state of king killers. The century began with the gunpowder plot, which was a foiled attempt to blow up king and parliament. Continued with the polarisation of king and parliament, which ended up in King Charles I losing his head the establishment of a republic, its failure, and the re-establishment of the monarchy, with all the opportunities for revenge that offered, and ended with the exile of a rightful king because he was a Catholic, and the establishment of a new Anglo-Dutch monarchy. Unsurprisingly, the unity of the church founded on those rocks. Historians suggest three critical moments in that process. Can we move that on, please? It's not, thank you. First came in the 1620s and 30s, as Archbishop William Lord and his followers pursued the beauty of holiness and the Catholicity of the church with a fervor so profound and devout that it shrank the possibilities of comprehension and sent many Puritans to seek the New Jerusalem in New England. Second was a violent swing back under the Republican Protectorate when Parliament ended up presiding over the fragmentation of Protestantism. Whether it was a godly coalition of nascent denominations and sects, as Cromwell probably perceived it, or sanctified anarchy will depend on your point of view. And the third defining moment was the Restoration Settlement. 
Charles II had been recalled by a predominantly Presbyterian parliament after the failure of the Republic in the wake of Cromwell's death. Charles had promised liberty for tender consciences, and he meant it. But the new parliament, composed largely of those who'd lost land and wealth during the revolution, seized the opportunity for revenge, and the religious settlement was caught up in that process. The Episcopalians, who had been marginalized during the Protectorate, emerged victorious after two years of debate, and the Act of Uniformity was imposed alongside enforcing legislation known as the Clarendon Code. It stipulated that worship should be according to the rites and ordinances of a revised Book of Common Prayer in a church that was properly Episcopally ordered. Roughly 10% of the clergy found those conditions unacceptable and were ejected from their livings, some 2,029 of them. The vast majority were moderate Puritans, mostly of a Presbyterian inclination. The small number of separatists who wanted no truck with any national church had already taken their leave. The moderates still hoped for comprehension and accommodation. Indeed, there were eight attempts to enact it in late Stuart parliaments, but all eight bills failed. Most Congregationalists and Presbyterians became dissenters not by conviction, but by contingency. They wanted to capture the establishment, not leave it. However, for the ejected, conscience had its limits, and so they went, along with many members of their congregations, to live as second-class citizens faced with intermittent violence, poverty, and restriction. The Clarendon Code established a system of apartheid. Nonconformists were excluded from public office. Their ministers could not teach in schools. They could not attend England's universities. And until 1689, when the Toleration Act was passed, they were not supposed to meet together for worship. 1662 is, as it were, a watershed, a moment to pause and ponder what traits we've discerned. Let me suggest a few. The first is the centrality of Scripture. Now, we who are the beneficiaries of modern biblical scholarship know that there's no such thing as the New Testament church. There are glimpses of many different models of church life. Puritans didn't know that, and they sought to align their lives and their church with Scripture. That is why the debates about the shape of the church were so passionate. The second is that congregationalism and Presbyterianism are very different. Both separatism in its pure form and more moderate versions are inherently dissenting. Caught in the tension identified by one recent historian between separating and belonging. Caught, we might say, between the local community of believers and the wider church, be that the URC or the wider church Catholic. It's a form of church government and organization which is powerfully resilient because in its classical form it's self-sufficient. Christ gifts the local church with all it needs. And that's probably one reason why Congregationalism flourished as a dissenting institution. Presbyterians never wanted to be dissenters. They wanted rather, as it were, to have the Church of Scotland in England, a properly reformed national church. Presbyterianism did not flourish post-1662, not least because it was never allowed to create the conciliar system a national reformed church needs for self-government. And by the early 19th century, English Presbyterianism was pretty weak, except north of the Tyne, and it was reinvigorated by Scottish migration. That form of Presbyterianism brought with it a very Scottish understanding of establishment. And in the 1840s, it was one of the pipe dreams of English Presbyterians – 
that the Church of England would drift off to Rome under the influence of Newman, Keeble, and the Tractarians, and they would emerge as the true English national church. Presbyterians are not averse to establishment. And with that went a certain style and ethos. I rather cherish the memory of John Gibb, an early professor of church history at Westminster College. He was to be found on Sundays besurpliced in King's College Chapel rather than besuited at St. Columbus. And the third is that Puritanism was international. There was first the exilic experience in Switzerland and the Netherlands, then life in the earliest American colonies through the Pilgrim Fathers and other colonists, and the traffic was in both directions. It's been estimated that one in four of Puritan settlers in America returned to Britain at least once before 1660. So, the centrality of scripture, the tension between separation and belonging, and an ambivalence towards establishment, and therefore a tension between dissent and a sense of the parish and the national church, which for the moment we'll assume to, be, uh, to mean having, um, having a concern and responsibilities for those beyond the membership list. And a clear discernment that the gospel was international. I think those characteristics can be discerned as we gaze into the mirror of life prior to 1662. What happened after 1662? This is a huge, long period in a very short time. <laughs> Post-1662 was a new world for nonconformists. They were those who had come out on the wrong side of history. The losers, the excluded, the second class, thrown onto their own resources and spiritualities. And first, though, I want to give you a glimpse of the transition from the old world to the new, and that can be traced in one of the ejected, a man called Francis Holcroft. And I've been doing a little bit of work on Francis Holcroft because he is uh, central to uh, the local church that I belong to, and I'm trying to do something about its history. Post-1662 was a new world. Holcroft was the son of Sir Henry Holcroft, a parliamentarian politician with a theological bent. Francis was educated at Clare College, Cambridge, where his roommate was a man called John Tillotson, the son of a Yorkshire clothier who worshipped with a congregational church at Sowerby during the time of the Republic. Both became fellows of Clare, and in 1662, Tillotson conformed and found himself uh, at the end of his days as William and Mary's Archbishop of Canterbury. Holcroft did not conform and found himself amongst the 2,029 ejected. What is remarkable is the energy and courage with which he threw himself into a new form of ministry. He seems to have founded some kind of congregational church at Bassingbourne in Hertfordshire, in the late 1650s, and it was truly gathered from many parts of Cambridgeshire. Post-1662, his genius was to realise that the essence of congregational ecclesiology was relational rather than geographical. What mattered was the covenanted group of believers, and he built a new ecclesial reality in Cambridgeshire, which he called the Church of Christ in Cambridgeshire. He was joined by a team of evangelists and ministers, including a couple of ejected fellows from Trinity College, and their work soon ranged over southern Cambridgeshire, North Hertfordshire, and Bedfordshire. It was a kind of circuit ministry before circuits were ever dreamt of. A members list survives in a very corrupt form from 1675, which contains 541 names, 363 women and 178 men, in 12 or so villages. And one of those churches was in Cambridge itself. Now, Holcroft wrote very little indeed. 
Uh, but in his work, we see a dynamic and organized man who formed circuits, if you like to call them that, which eventually solidified into coherent fellowships, some eventually supplying or creating their own buildings and becoming chapels and meeting houses, as in the great meeting at Cambridge, which eventually became Emmanuel Congregational Church, which is now part of Downing Place. And you can see that slowly but surely, distinctive marks of a dissenting subculture began to appear, gaining definition as the world of persecution became the world of toleration. First, there were those precious buildings, meeting houses where the faithful gathered, plain, airy, modest, elegant, dark pews, white walls, perhaps a three-decker pulpit if there was a gallery. Three-decker pulpits aren't to put the preacher out of touch with the congregation, they're to put the preacher in touch with the congregation who were in the top gallery. Then there was the worship. Far too wordy for our age, but words were for the 18th and 19th centuries what visual images are for ours. The average service lasted about two hours with prayers, psalms and hymn singing, readings from scriptures which were expounded, and a sermon as well. And then they did the same in the afternoon, and discussions continued in homes around the half in the evening. I wonder at their stamina. Then there was governance. Most buildings were owned by trustees. But the life of the church and decisions about membership were decided by the members. It was self-governing, yet never self-contained. With a subculture of cousinhoods and friendships reaching far beyond the chapel walls, creating the relational base for national organization. But it was not yet denominational as we understand it. There was a porous membrane between what we would now term congregational and Presbyterian. Clergy moved easily through the membrane and chapels switched designation regularly. As the 18th century wore on and theological opinions evolved, congregational perhaps signified orthodoxy against the more advanced label of Presbyterian. And certainly by the end of the century, for reasons that are still obscure, many Presbyterian chapels had passed into Unitarianism. But dissenters were forging a new world, resilient, articulate, shrewd, and eventually powerful. Their Republican forebears had been no fools, of course. Richard Baxter was the most prolific author of his age. John Owen, Dean of Christ Church Oxford in Cromwell's time, was amongst the greatest theologians of his day, and some would argue that he's high in the pantheon of congregational theologians of all time. The world of old descent was cultured, educated, sophisticated. Contingency had cast it on hard times, yet its response was vital and vivid. Excluded from England's two universities, they set about creating an alternative educational system, the dissenting academies. They're an object lesson in creativity. Many of the ejected were fellows of Oxbridge colleges, and it was only natural that members of dissenting congregations should look to them for private tuition for their children, who were proscribed from the universities. And academies grew from that root. One of the most impressive early academies was that of Charles Morton at Newington Green in London, enrolling as many as 50 students at a time, providing a syllabus that covered classics, history, geography, mathematics, natural science, politics, modern languages, and educating, amongst others, Samuel Wesley, who was John and Charles's father, and the novelist Daniel Defoe. Academies multiplied across the country, providing both a broad-based education and ministerial training. Most notable was Philip Doddridge's Northampton Academy, 
And so respected did Dodgeris become as a writer on spirituality and as an educationalist that when Hartford College Oxford was refounded, its principal sought Doddridge's advice on its new statutes. But that was just the tip of a cultural iceberg. Below the surface was a considerable organization of funding, the Common Board Fund of 1689, the Congregational Fund Board, 1695, the King's Head Society, 1730, the Coward Trust, 1743, all to fund ministerial training and make educational provision for the academies. Some also funded studies in the Scottish universities and Leiden and Utrecht, where dissenters were welcome. As English university provision secularized from the 1830s onwards, dissenting academies evolved. Homerton College's theological work became part of New College London in 1850, and the academy moved into teacher training, eventually moving to Cambridge in 1894 and becoming a full university college in 2010. Both Northern College and Westminster College have dissenting academy DNA. What is emerging then is a new subculture, resilient, articulate, shrewd, and eventually powerful. During the 1730s and 40s, old dissent, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Baptists met new dissent, the evangelical revival, and the explosive force of Whitfield, the Wesleys, and Methodism. It was not altogether an easy conjunction. Old dissent, as we've seen, had developed its own disciplines and spirituality. The meeting house, the gathered congregation, the sermon, holy communion, a congregational discipline providing the structure for holy living. And the new dissent seemed undisciplined, irregular, uncouth even, as it crossed established boundaries and took the gospel literally into the fields and streets. And there was a widespread suspicion of enthusiasm. <laughs> but the end result was the reinvigoration of old dissent, just a few headlines. I mean, in Wales, the Anglican layman Hal Harris's revival changed the tone of Welsh nonconformity. In England, Congregationalism was transformed between about 1760 and 1820 as it absorbed the effects of the revival, and many of the students trained at the Countess of Huntingdon's College in Trefecca, which later became Chesed College in Hertfordshire, ended up in Congregationalism. One notable example from the north is William Roby, whose deep commitment to evangelism transformed Lancashire congregationalism into a powerhouse, whilst at the same time growing his own congregation at Grosvenor Street in Manchester from 150 to 1,200 between 1795 and 1830. In Scotland, Whitfield's preaching energized those with evangelical sympathies from a variety of denominational backgrounds to work together in various mission enterprises. And amongst their number were two wealthy brothers, James and Robert Haldane, who in 1798 formed the Society for Propagating the Gospel at Home. They wanted to buy up the patronage of livings and build extra parochial places of worship, which would be open to preachers of any persuasion. And inevitably, they ran into opposition from the Church of Scotland. Despite that, the society continued to grow and began to sponsor congregational churches and educate ministers to lead them. The Haldane brothers were on a personal spiritual journey, and they soon became Baptists and the society terminated in 1808. And that meant that the funding for those congregational churches in Scotland which w w was under threat, and that in turn led those churches to form the Glasgow Theological Academy to train ministers in 1811, and then the Scottish Congregational Union in 1812, the prime purpose of which was to support home mission and 
the 55 already existing congregations. In 1896, the Congregational Union united with 90 congregations of the Evangelical Union, which had been founded by James Morrison in 1843. And so you can see Scottish congregationalism had different roots and a subtly different texture to English and Welsh congregationalism. Its birth lay not in an attempt to capture an establishment with a different ideology, but in the possibilities of mission. Nonetheless, during the 19th and 20th centuries, interchanges of people and ideas between English, Scottish, and Welsh congregationalism was notable. The Abaddonian liturgist John Hunter ministered in both England and Scotland before the First World War. The English theologian and musician Eric Routley in the 50s and 60s served as minister of Augustine Bristow uh, Congregational Church in Edinburgh before moving to America. And Charles Duffy moved from the Scottish Congregational College to become principal of New College London in 1964. Now, the dissenting subculture, which uh, was greatly enlarged by the evangelical revival and the growth of Methodism, had one great advantage over the Church of England. It was mobile. It took an act of parliament to create a new parish church. Dissenters could have a whip round and knock up a tin tabernacle in a couple of days. <laughs> there was a massive movement of population from the middle of the 18th century onwards as the British economy moved from an agrarian to an industrial base. And you can see the figures on the, on the board. Uh, in 1750, 15% of the population lived in settlements of over 5,000. That rises to 50% by 1851, nearly 75% in 1901. And dissent, as it were, baptized the Industrial Revolution because it moved with the people and caught their aspirations. Artisans and entrepreneurs, new industrialists, local capitalists. Chapel was the natural milieu for Titus Salt, the Bradford alpaca prince, the carpeting Crossleys of Halifax, the mustard-making Colemans of Norwich, the shirt-manufacturing Bannermans of Manchester, and the jam-making Chivers of Histon. Nonconformity helped transform industrialising Victorial England. And as it did so, it developed the paraphernalia of denominationalism. The Congregational Union of England and Wales was formed in 1832, bringing together over 34 county associations, and the following year it adopted a confession of faith. The Presbyterians back in England due to Scottish migration formed their own synod in 1836, becoming an independent church in 1844 in the wake of the Scottish disruption the previous year. The 1840s also saw the first conference of the Churches of Christ in Britain, in Edinburgh, in 1842. The origins of the movement can be traced in dissenting Presbyterianism, both in Ireland and Scotland, in the late 18th century, more particularly in Thomas Campbell and his son Alexander, who emigrated to the States. Thomas had experienced weekly communion in an independent church in Glasgow before uh, emigration. And he also thought that all Presbyterians should be welcomed to communion in his church, which was a dissenting Presbyterian church who thought that only their own members should attend. He was censured by his presbytery and resigned to form a new movement. And he set out his principles in his declaration and address the first proposition of which states that the Church of Christ upon earth is essentially, intentionally, and constitutionally one, consisting of all those in every place that profess their faith in Christ and obedience to him in all things according to the scripture, and that manifest the same by their tempers and conduct, and of none else, as none can truly and properly be called Christians." Disunity, he stated later, was a horrid evil. Alexander was profoundly impressed and took on the work of the association, which became a church in 1811. The history is complex, 
Yet, in essence, the churches were a restorationist movement determinedly guided by scripture rather than the creeds, adopting believers' baptism because it was the New Testament model, convinced of the centrality of Holy Communion, which belonged to the people rather than a clerical caste. It was for that reason that local elders rather than itinerant ministers were Eucharistic presidents. And like all dissenters, they benefited from the chapel-building bonanza of mid-Victorian Britain. Dissenters were becoming a power in the land. The 1851 religious census revealed the church going country was almost equally divided between church and chapel. 51% were to be found in the pews of parish churches. 44% were in chapels of various kinds. But what was frightening to contemporaries and salutary for us is that 90, uh, sorry, is that 59.5% of the population were not in church at all. And more of that later. Such a powerful force as dissent could no longer be second-class citizens. And the 19th century saw the gradual erosion of civil disabilities created by the Restoration Settlement. The irony, of course, is that once it had come to power, wealth, and respectability, with its own members of parliament, who were, of course, overwhelmingly liberal, and was educating its children at Oxford and Cambridge, in other words, by the late 19th century, it began to lose its powers of recruitment. It had brought a new world to birth, but the citizens of that world had grown up, and a good number either thought Anglicanism was a better bet or drifted into nominalism. Congregationalism's membership peaked as the First World War broke out. Presbyterianism fared better because its membership curve shadowed Scottish migration into England. So let the First World War be our next watershed, the end of the Golden Age. And let's ponder the traits we've seen observing, we've seen emerging. First, there was something remarkable about the ways in which the ejected, and I mean lay people as well as ministers, created a new world from nothing but their own spiritual resources. Nothing like those Ur circuits had been seen in England before Holcroft's day. There may well have been some in Wales, but there were certainly none in England. It was a thoughtful, thoroughly practical, and deeply pastoral way to forge new networks of believers, letting a covenanted relationship overturn geographical constraints, yet at the same time respecting geography, place, and attachment to it. And churches grew around believers nurtured by an itinerant ministry. Secondly, worship evolved. Dissent's great gift to the world was the modern hymn. Think of Watts and Wesley. And what evolved was a biblical-centric space which was very different to the set liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer. It was attuned to the rhythm and cadences of Scripture, carefully expounded, thoughtfully applied. By the late 19th century, it had made peace with imagery, stained glass, ritual, but not ritualism, and music. And yet it was still held by the beauty of holiness. And there was, of course, as there is now, the world of difference between something like King's Way House in London's Mayfair and the village churches of Somerset and Dorset. Third, permanence meant finance, wealth, legal know-how, trustees, buildings, and funds. This was a voluntarist movement of the people for the people, and dissenters trusted their lay people. Dissenting academies, teacher training colleges, and theological colleges do not build themselves. Now, there is, of course, a shadow side to that that John alluded to earlier. The URC is rightly examining its links to slavery, and we await the results of that research. My hunch is that the investigators will not have far to look because the effects of the, tra of the trade were pervasive in trade and commerce in the 18th century. William Coward of the Coward Trust was a plantation owner in Jamaica, bringing sugar and spice to England and taking naval supplies back. His largest ship was char chartered three times 
by the Royal African Company for use in the slave trade. Selina, Countess of Huntingdon, was a slave owner, as well as the patroness of the poet Phyllis Wheatley, and a key figure in the evangelical rev revival. She remained an Anglican, but our churches benefited from her preachers and her college. Well, as I say, that work is in hand. But as we survey the complexity and ambiguity of our heritage, we need to be aware of it. And fourthly, on the margins of dissenting history, we see the emergence of two further strands of the URC's DNA. We note the further flexibility of congregationalism as it played out in a very different historical environment in Scotland, and also the restorationist and strikingly ecumenical vision of the Churches of Christ, witnessing to the centrality of Holy Communion and believers' baptism. And finally, during this long period, we note once more the complexity of having traditions that stretch across three nations, the subtlety of contingency and nationality. But we are at a watershed. The golden age is over. Life was to be very different for nonconformity after the First World War. Christendom began to crumble. Well, we'll return to that in part two. But now I'd, I'd like you to think about some questions. Um, I want to give you about 20 minutes because you know, those seats get hard after a while. Um, we're going to have to do this in, in clusters and buzz groups and just be COVID aware as you do it and keep yourselves reasonably distanced. But ask yourself what you cherish about your inheritance. Um, what frustrates you most? What inspires you uh, for today's mission? And what would you like to chuck on the bonfire? Um, and if you want to join me this evening, we'll pursue some of those questions and, 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 and a few others. But for the moment, get up, stretch your legs, and, and gather and just have a think about that together uh, for about 20 minutes. And we'll come back together for part two at five past five, okay? Well, from my point of view, that was an extremely, uh, extremely pleasing, um, noisy, buzzing sound, even if you were saying, I wish to God he'd shut up. Um, <laughs> but I, I hope there's uh, some conversations there that you can continue as, as the week goes on. Uh, what I want to do now is talk about how we handle that inheritance. Uh, and I want to talk a bit about 1972. I want to talk a bit about ecumenism. And I want to talk about uh, secularization, which was something John touched on earlier. And then, because I can't resist it, I'm going to have a peek over the theological hedge at the end. When the United Reformed Church was formed in 1972, its architects could look back to the watershed of the First World War and survey their inheritance, and they understood well the strengths and weaknesses of their two traditions. As they pondered their fortunes between 1918 and 1972, they would have noted two overwhelming narratives. The first had been spelt out as early as 1851 in the religious census. 59.5% of the population were not in church on census Sunday. And the experience of the gentle yet unremitting fall in membership figures since 1918 simply underlined the reality that the world was changing and church going was a decreasing part of it. And the second would have been the dominant narrative of ecumenism, and I want to deal with that one first. Great conferences peter out I can think of scores that I've attended that have promised much and achieved little. That was not true of the Edinburgh Missionary Conference of 1910. The conference had been called to allow the representatives of missionary societies working in non-Christian cultures to take counsel together and prepare joint strategies for what John Mott had called the evangelization of the world in this generation. 
In passing, it highlighted the absurdity of exporting Western denominational divisions into Asia and Africa. It spawned a continuation committee which did great work in the wake of the Versailles settlement of 1919, which uh, ended the First World War, in protecting the work of missionary societies across the world and of protecting indigenous churches. And it gave birth to a series of conferences in the 1920s and 30s, which were to lead to the formation of the International Missionary Conference and the World Council of Churches. Other international initiatives shared the same desire to ensure that Europe was never again racked by world war. In 1917, Nathan Söderblom, the Lutheran primate of neutral Sweden during the war, proposed a council to consider the life and work of the churches. In England, quite independently, the brilliant young Bishop of Manchester, William Temple, planned a national conference on political and economic citizenship called COPEC. His deputy was the Congregationalist theologian A.E. Garvey. The initiatives came together as life and work, another nascent strand of the World Council. By 1938, there was a World Council of Churches in embryo, although it did not meet until 1948 because of the war. It was not just the emergence of world structures that was exciting. As the architects of the URC looked back, they could see that their traditions had been catalysts in the formation of United Churches. The United Church of Canada in 1925, the Church of South India in 1947, the United Church of Christ in the US in 1957. As they looked across the Christian world, they could see that Pope John XXIII had summoned the Second Vatican Council in 1958 and that it was still in remarkable session. In 1961, they could see that the Orthodox had attended the World Council of Churches in New Delhi for the first time, along with a smattering of Pentecostals from South America. All things seemed possible ecumenically in 1963, when the British Council of Churches began to plan its Faith and Order Conference, which was part of their follow-up to the New Delhi Assembly. And in May 1963, the Congregational Union of England and Wales responded positively to an overture from the Presbyterian Church of England about possible union. As the British Council of Churches Faith and Order Conference met at Nottingham in 1964, unity schemes were underway in Sri Lanka, Ghana, Nigeria, Zambia, and Jamaica. This was an international movement and Britain was part of it. And it was Norman Goodall, the great Congregationalist missionary statesman of the mid-20th century, who proposed to the conference what he called the splendidly irrational symbol that the British churches should unite no later than Easter Day 1980. Only 53 out of the 550 attendees demurred. What I really want you to understand is that the mood going up to 1963 was one of an increasing wave of ecumenical possibility. By the end of the decade, the mood had changed completely, and Goodall's symbol had turned into a pipe dream. Now, there were many reasons. The first was Vatican II and its decree on ecumenism, which made the Roman Catholic Church a serious ecumenical conversation partner for the first time. The second was the marginal failure of the Anglican Methodist unity scheme just six months before the URC came into being. And a third was a slow change in the ecumenical climate, an emerging distrust of grand narratives, be it Marxism, Christianity, or ecumenism. What we came to call later postmodernism was coming to life. I do notice with some pleasure that it seems to have died. <laughs> However, as part of its commitment to ecumenism in its uniting service and assembly, 
The United Reformed Church invited partner churches to join in further discussions about the possibility of unity, a process which resulted in the ill-fated uh, Church's Unity Commission and the Ten Propositions for Unity, uh, which was rejected by the Church of England in 1982, at which point the other partners, the Methodists, the Moravians, and the Churches of Christ also withdrew. Nonetheless, the United Reformed Church faithfully pursued its vocation, playing a full part in the interchurch process from 1985 to 1990, which led to the dissolution of the British Council of Churches and the creation of the new ecumenical instruments, eventually churches together in Britain and Ireland. A process skillfully glided by Philip Morgan, a URC minister and former General Secretary of the Churches of Christ. And those new instruments were necessary because the ecumenical conversation was much broader. As Catholicism moved, in Cardinal Hume's momentous words at Swanwick in 1987, from cooperation to commitment. Ecumenism in Britain was no longer just an Anglican Free Church, Church of Scotland interchange. It now involved Catholics, Pentecostals, and some of the so-called new churches. The broadening of the conversation made the quest for unity harder and more complex. Pope John Paul II's invitation to help rethink the Petrine ministry in Ut Unumsint of 1995 demands a long time scale. Similarly, tensions around church order, human sexuality, and ethics become less tractable as theological conservatives engage with theological liberals. And it was that broadening conversation that marked the end of the ecumenical era, which had been ushered in by Edinburgh 1910. That meant that the United Reformed Church, whose raison d'etre was to be a temporary stage on a journey to a wider united church, had to address its purpose and identity anew. And the first reality to note is that the church has remained true to its basis of union, despite the change in the ecumenical climate. Its commitment to unity has been profound, Unions with the Churches of Christ in 1981 and the Congregational Union of Scotland in 2001 were not safe options. The first involved the reconciliation of believers and pedo-baptism. The second made a church in three nations a serious partner in Scottish ecumenism. But that was a united church working out its ecumenical vocation. Unity isn't about the easy and obvious, but it is about seeking reconciliation and breaking down barriers. And that commitment has been further seen in the URC's enthusiastic participation in local ecumenism, especially in LEPs and United Congregations. Those unions have intensified the diversity of traditions which have come together in the URC, and it's worth recalling some that we've explored. A tension between separation and belonging, the local and the wider, the tensions between being establishment averse and not, the diversity within the different nations of Great Britain, and finally the internationalism of those traditions which was only enhanced by the ecumenical century. And then there was the extraordinary creativity that crafted a subculture out of nothing and that remarkable witness of Thomas Campbell to the sin of disunity before the ecumenical movement was even a dream. These are not simple traditions. Indeed, some might have judged them incompatible. I mean, presumably those who opted out of the three unions in 1972, 1981 and 2001 they feared something about their identity would be lost. And yet the three traditions have grown together. Not least because of their underlying commitment to the principal and dominical command of unity. A commitment to unity is not simply a commitment to ecumenical conversation. 
It is a commitment to work out what unity in Christ, true Catholicity, means for those who are in Christ and for the world which Christ came to save. The adoption of auxiliary ministry, based loosely on the Churches of Christ tradition of elders, the holding together of the validity of both infant and believer's baptism, and the commitment to gender equality, which lies behind the 1997 decision to allow a gender-neutral statement of faith to stand alongside the original, are about three glimpses of a determined attempt to work towards Catholicity and to understand and live unity. Ministry and discipleship belong in Christ, and in unity with Christ, distinctions of gender and tradition become increasingly insignificant. Similarly, Union with the Congregational Union of Scotland in 2001 marked the introduction of two national synods, Wales and Scotland, within a denominational assembly, achieved in the face of the overriding societal dynamics of devolution. The Church Catholic is more than a nation without diminishing the importance and distinctions of nationhood. The increasing diversity of the three nations and its churches as a result of decolonization and migration was recognized by the United Reformed Church affirming itself to be a multicultural church at the 2005 General Assembly. That was a further working out of what Catholicity might look like. Tension and pluralism are not signs of failure but of a vibrant and determined attempt to struggle with the gospel itself. Put theologically, the United Reformed Church is on a journey to discover what it means for all who are in Christ to be one. That ecumenical commitment, which has become more of a theological instinct, engages with diversity and always runs the risk of mistaking the radicalism of the gospel for the fads of contemporary culture. However, conciliarity has a high premium within the Reformed tradition, including its dissenting wing. From its inception, the United Reformed Church has agonized about which councils and at what level but it has always been clear that discernment of the spirit lies through conversation, listening, prayer, and the study of scripture. It's always easy to lament the lack of identity. And yet identity for a Christian, other than being in Christ, is always in flux. Robert Brown's separatism was not John Robinson's congregationalism, nor was his congregationalism Nathaniel Micklem's. John Knox would not have recognized much that he would appreciate in George MacLeod's Presbyterianism, and John Huxtable and Arthur MacArthur did indeed struggle with what the United Reformed Church was becoming. And that is why former Presbyterians will tell you that the URC is a congregational church, my congregationalists will tell you that congregational principles have disappeared and members of the Church of Christ lament that little is left. <laughs> the church is an event of the spirit. It is always becoming. And that is only proper, according to the basis of union. Despite our failure and weakness as a church, Christ continues to call the church and so the church has learnt that its life must ever be renewed and reformed according to the scriptures, <coughs> I'm sorry, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So if ecumenism was a preoccupation because of the URC's particular charism as the first united church of two distinct and different traditions in England since the Reformations, the context in which it came to birth was one of deep secularity. And that's what I want to turn to next. Congregational membership in England and Wales peaked in 1906 at 498,718. And from that high point, a slow decline set in. In the 40 years between 1930 and 1970, 
English Congregationalism lost 40% of its membership, a process which accelerated between 1960 and 70 when the rate of decline was 22%. Presbyterian Church of England was a bit insulated against this by its reliance between the end of the war and the 1960s on a rising curve of Scottish migration into England. But Congregationalism's experience was of a gentle, consistent decline throughout the 20th century. The Church of England experienced a gentler downward curve. Easter Day communicants fell by 16% between 1910 and 50, grew between 1950 and 60, and then fell into line with Congregational experience in the decade 60 to 70, with a 24% decline. And those contrasting stories point to an historical truth. Secularization, however it is de defined, has deep roots. Yet the 1960s were a pivotal decade of change in religious behavior. More and more people quietly stopped going to church. Now, unsurprisingly, the formation of the United Reformed Church did nothing to halt that trend. In 1973, the United Reformed Church had 192,136 members in 2,141 churches, and in 2022, it has 40,024 members in 1,284 churches, a 79% fall in membership and a 40% reduction in places of worship. It was not unique in that experience. Methodist membership fell by 73% between 1970 and 2020, and its number of churches by 36% between 1972 and 2018. The URC's sister reform church, the Church of Scotland, saw its communicants decline by 63% between 1980 and 2016 and the Church of Scotland's sister establishment, the Church of England, fared little better. Attendance on a usual Sunday, as opposed to a feast day, fell by 55% between 1970 and 2019. The experience of the free churches, and particularly of congregationalism, is that the roots of this decline are deep. Nonconformity's decline is inextricable from its unprecedented growth in the 19th century, which we touched on before the discussion, when evangelical nonconformity brought that alternative world of those excluded by the 1662 religious settlement into the mainstream of English and Welsh life and to spiritual and political maturity and equality. During the 20th century, the massive recruitment of the 19th century declined to a trickle, and as the century progressed, Congregationalism found even retention of its own children difficult. It was not that new members were not being made. They were, but in nowhere near the numbers needed to replace the aging and dying. And that pattern has become iterative and it probably explains the decennial decline of the United Reformed Church since 2000. Now that painful and difficult experience of living with decline has dominated the British churches over the past century, but with particular force over the past 50 years. It is the dominant contour of the Western European Christian landscape. It is the experience of secularization in the broad sense of the fading social influence of religion in a society, and it is pervasive in Western Europe. Its roots and progress are a matter of rich debate amongst historians and sociologists of religion, with readers being offered starting points dating from the Reformation to the 1960s, and theories that range from secularization being an inevitable consequence of modernization and industrialization to acceptance of the reality of religious decline and skepticism about the validity of any theory at all. But the experience, our experience, in churches and chapels is of pews thinning out and congregations growing older. 
Now that said, it's important to appreciate that at any time in church history, growth and decline have coexisted. I've just put the names of three scholars who, who look at this field on, on the board so that you can see something of the range of views that are around. There have always been individual congregations which have bucked the trend. And indeed, there have been in the history of the United Reformed Church. Some people have pointed to the growth of Pentecostalism and the new churches and to Anglican fresh expressions and to the experience of church growth in London as either desecularization or re-sacralization. Uh, I think it's doubtful that these are more than examples of simultaneous growth and decline. Nevertheless, the overall British pattern remains one of unremitting decline according to the last full study of the figures which came out last year. To put it differently, as Callum Brown, who teaches at Glasgow, has done, the lifetime of the United Reformed Church has seen the triumph of a positive story of the human discovery of a new moral cosmos, which is humanist and atheist. And it's just worth touching for a moment on Brown's work. His perspective is humanist, and he has turned the study of secularization on its head because he has analyzed the growth of the non-religious ethic in a book called Becoming Atheist, Humanism and the Secular West, and the battle for Christian Britain, Sex, Humanists and Secularization, 1945 to 1980. Becoming Atheist allows people to still tell their stories of leaving Christianity behind them. The battle returns to one of his earlier theories, that the sexual revolution of the long 1960s and the growth of female autonomy correlate with the curve of the dramatic decline in Christian commitment. He argues, and I think it's growingly persuasive, that the attempt by conservative Christianity in the wake of the Second World War to control sexuality, and in particular what women did with their bodies, left, led to the creation of a secular liberalism which trounced conservative Christianity in the 1970s and has since been unstoppable. He's always a controversial historian and he simplifies too much, but his evidence is powerful. Alec Ryrie, who teaches at Durham, puts it more subtly, and he's, he's uh, an Anglican lay reader, so he's writing from a position of Christian commitment. He argues that the long shadow of the Second World War revealed that the church had got its priorities wrong. The Nazi regime re revealed that the true evils were not sex, blasphemy, and impiety, which was where the church put its emphasis, but cruelty, discrimination, and murder. Observing this in the 1950s and 60s, nominally religious people opted to fashion a new ethics for themselves and in consequence drifted away from or rejected their religious upbringing. What mattered was equality, self-determination and tolerance, the very obverse of the true evil that was the Hitler regime. In the public mind and in many private imaginations, Morality has been severed from its Christian roots, and that is a sea change in modern religious history. When Leslie Newbigin retired to Birmingham in 1974 from the Church of South India, he described England as the most difficult mission field he had ever encountered and set about analyzing the intellectual challenges facing Christianity in a series of books, including The Other Side of 1984 and Foolishness to the Greeks, arguing passionately for the church to take mission seriously and analyze the components of Britain's cultural assumptions. Now, denominations and local churches 
the United Reformed Church and its congregations amongst them have exercised extraordinary creativity as they have attempted to handle such a difficult mission context. <clears throat> and I've just raked some of those out from um, the histories. Commitment to industrial mission in the 1970s, the creating of church-related community work as a distinct ministry in 1980, the development of youth leadership training officers from 1973, the use of Yardley Hastings as a center for developing the ministry of young people in 1985, the transformation of the manse at Windermere into a lay training center in 1987, the appointment of a national AIDS advisor in 1987, the thoughtful deployment of special category ministries and now pioneer ministers. And an equally impressive creativity has been shown in the proliferation of worship resources that has been produced through the last 50 years. And in report after report and program after program, the United Reformed Church has sought to deploy its resources to maximum effect. Such creativity has been by no means unique to the United Reformed Church. But as Steve Bruce, who uh, is a socio-atheist soli sociologist of religion who teaches at Aberdeen, has noted, the best efforts of church leaders and activists since the start of the 20th century have failed to turn the secularizing trend. Even the Baptist Union of Great Britain, which adopted a deliberate strategy of evangelism, growth, and renewal in the 1990s, and has the gentlest level of decline amongst mainstream denominations, has seen a 51% reduction in its membership between 1970 and 2020, and an 11% drop in its places of worship. That's just the mission context that we happen to be in. So, some concluding theological thoughts. Well, we've explored some of the things that historians and sociologists of religion think has been happening over the past half century. I've been ordained for 43 of those years, and my reflection is that we have been pacing a profoundly difficult mission context I hope I've managed to show how creatively the URC has sought to deploy its resources and develop mission strategies through that time. And from John's uh, input earlier this afternoon, um, it is no different now. It is still an extraordinarily creative uh, place to be. Now, church history as a discipline sits uncomfortably on the fault line between divine grace and human responsibility. And it actually belongs firmly on the human side because it's part of the historical and human sciences. But in this final part of the presentation, I want to move to the other side of the line because theologians deal in the data of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. We've looked at ways in which tradition and identity have been shaped and we've noted continual flux. And that should not surprise us, because the church resides in the activity and grace of the Holy Spirit. Christian identity is ultimately to be found in what the Methodist historian Tom Greggs calls an event of the act of God in contemporary history. An event of the act of God in contemporary history. And grateful though we are for our past and the hand of God in it, our identity is to be found in faithfulness to the Spirit's Christ-shaped activity as she creates the event of the church day by day, week by week. No one doubts the seriousness of the situation faced by the churches of Western Europe. And equally, none of us doubt the reality of being in Christ. It is worth remembering that as Western Europe has become increasingly secularized, the center of Christian gravity has moved decisively to the Southern Hemisphere. And it is a nice irony that migration has made that Southern vibrancy part of British Christian experience and indeed of the United Reformed Church. And that's just a small lesson in perspective. <clears throat> 
What matters is not what the world counts success, nor the crystallizing of a particular URC identity. Unique selling propositions, much beloved of management consultants, belong to soap powders, cars, and breakfast cereal, not the Church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> being in Christ is not primarily about being part of a particular community, important though that is for the experience of belonging, but of being part of the whole body of Christ through space and time. And in that sense, the United Reformed Church is part of the world church, which is the Church Catholic. The Church Catholic, the sum of all believers who claim that Jesus is Lord, is part of the Spirit's activity in the world now. The United Reformed Church, in all its weakness and frustration, as well as its vitality and vision and creativity, is part of that greater body, part of the Spirit's activity. The Church Catholic is an event of the Holy Spirit in the contingencies of history. So the being of the Church rests only on the faithful and constant acts of God the Holy Spirit, to quote Todd Greggs again. Today and tomorrow and on into God's future, we and our partner churches and the churches of Western Europe will continue to be part of the Spirit's activity in the flux of contingency. Whether that will be growth or decline is in a sense irrelevant because the task of the church is to rejoice in being part of the eventful activity of the Spirit and to enter as fully as possible into the Spirit's movement towards the world that God loved and has, loves and has redeemed in Christ. And as it does so, it will discern what the church is, what the church is for in the economy of God in secular Western Europe, and so offer itself for new patterns of Christian living and discipleship. Now, my brief for this conference was to do the history bit, it will be for the other speakers to open up the joys of Jubilee theology and spirituality, as Doug was beginning to do in our worship. But I can't resist just a peek over the fence <laughs> to try and join history and Jubilee together. Jubilee is thrilling because it is the quite mad proclamation that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Jubilee is thrilling for that particular reason. It is the complete obverse of all human attitudes to land and therefore wealth. Under capitalism, land belongs to the wealthy and the right to it is inalienable through inheritance. Under Marxism, the land is the people's expressed through the state. Jubilee proclaims that the land is God's. The people of Israel remembered their exodus God through the Sabbath, the sabbatical year, uh, uh, when every seventh year the land lies fallow, and in Jubilee, every 50 years, seven times seven plus one, when all leased and mortgaged lands were returned to their original owners and slaves were freed. As Walter Brueggemann has noted, the intent was that every moment of Israel's life should be shot through with the radicality of God. And the social fabric has the political economy of its instrument, as its instrument. Sorry, read that again. The social fabric has the political economy as its instrument, unlike our practice, where the social fabric <coughs> receives the leftovers of the political economy. Jubilee is the year of the Lord's favor, garlands instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit, good news, liberty, release, Isaiah 61. And then as Doug pointed out, according to Luke, Jesus came and said, I am Jubilee. All this is fulfilled in me. Look around you at the evidence of my kingdom. And he preached a sermon about it, sometimes called the Nazareth Manifesto, right at the start of his ministry in Luke 4, 
and they tried to throw him off a cliff. The powerful and the self-interested have always found the Magnificat world hard. Thrones and good things are hard to relinquish. But, says Jesus, the year of the Lord's favor is among you. Let jubilee enfold you, be liberated, be set free, breathe kingdom air. What does Jesus say to us, the church in Western Europe, in Britain, in this odd, bizarre mission field, and to you as you minister in it? Me, I'm retired, you're not. <laughs> be set, not that my wife believes me, be, be set free says Jesus, be set free from your mistakes, from the intolerable burden of Victorian success which you think you ought to emulate, from the dominant discourse of secularization which assumes that God is dead. Be set free. Live the jubilee in which good news is for the poor, Prisoners are set free, the blind see, and the oppressed leap with life and laughter. And if they pass by, well, let them. Remember, they tried to throw me off a cliff. Be set free, because it's not your responsibility to save the world. I've done that, done it for you, and for all those who pass by. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, and it's not for you to worry about them. Their salvation isn't your business, it's mine. Be set free. Live in the Spirit's wonderful imagination. Be my people. Open your eyes to the blessings that surround you, and set my kingdom free. We've, we've a quarter of an hour. Part of me says questions. Part of me says you probably want to get out of this room, <laughs> breathe some fresh air. I, oh, sorry, Adrian. I do apologize. <laughs> <laughs>